Good morning, friends. A very good morning to all of you. Welcome to the fourth day of our 21st, 21 days online course on human rights. I hope you rested well last night. You have a very special resource person with you today who will be with you. She has the privilege of being with you the whole day. Nobody has had that privilege. And we welcome into our midst very warmly Akila Ramalingam from Chennai. Akila is a, uh, is a lawyer who practices in Chennai, largely in the High Court of Chennai. She has completed her law in the National Law School, University of India in Bangalore. Thereafter, her course in BCL at the University of Oxford, where she specialized in international law and then completed her LLM in the, in the New York University. All of you are getting a little worried. Oh my goodness, a lawyer from National Law School in UK, in USA, she may not come down to our level. Hold on, hold your breath. <coughs> she has been a visiting faculty at the National Law University in Delhi in the years 2013 to 2015. She has also taught in the National Law School in Bangalore from 2012 to 2000, 2010 to 12, where she was a visiting faculty. She is a consultant in the National Judicial Academy, handling sessions for judges. She uh, is uh, somebody who engages continuously in legal literacy programs. In terms of practice, she practices in human rights and family law, uh, files PILs in court and specializes in cases of medical negligence, extrajudicial killings, prison reforms, uh, juvenile justice, and a host of other laws. In, and also protects human rights defenders and NGOs in a variety of cases. She is a co-founder of Parvai Advisor, which is uh, working on issues of inclusion and diversity. Uh, they are particularly specializing in matters relate, relating to sexual harassment at the workplace. Here you have a young, academic, a young practitioner, and a young public-spirited lawyer who excels in whatever she does. She's a prolific writer. She writes excellently. And throughout her career, whether she was in law school or whether she was later in the university teaching, her passion was always for writing. And she participates in a number of international and national conferences as an academic writer. We welcome you, Akila. It's our pleasure to have you today. You will, she will be dealing um, with very tough subject. I wanted to give the youngest person the, the toughest subject, and that was the overview of all the thematic human rights and laws related to various thematic rights that we will be covering in the next almost five or six days. Over to you, Akila. All the best. Thank, Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh... Thank you very much for that very kind introduction. And uh, yes, it is a privilege indeed to be in front of you uh, for the entire day today. I hope uh, most of you find it useful. Uh, and I hope this helps you sort of think through issues that will definitely come up in the coming weeks of this course. Uh, so. Yeah, I understand uh, from the organizers that the participants come from a variety of backgrounds uh, with various experiences uh, behind you. So what we will be doing today is uh, an introductory session, an overview session, as uh, Mr. Henry had pointed out, which will give you a bird's eye view of sort of uh, various human rights that we have and various laws related to human rights that we have. And of course, this is now going to be more specific to India. So I understand that you might have been talking about definition of human rights uh, in the previous days. 
uh, about understanding human rights at a broader level which can be applied to any legal system. Uh, and yes, that's where we will start from, but we will also focus on uh, what are the, what is the kind of laws? Again, this is a bird's eye view session, as all of you can understand. Uh, it is not possible to uh, comprehensively look at each and every legislation or law relating to human rights that there is. But what we will try and do is get a big picture of uh, understanding what human rights uh, of thematically understanding the kinds of human rights that we have also understanding how these human rights are effectuated uh, again you know we can uh, you can understand that there would be laws with differing levels of successes as well some would embody human rights in its spirit and its letter some may go a little bit helter skelter so this is also for you to uh, understand this big picture so you can again start forming those opinions critiquing analyzing specific laws uh, so that you can also take this forward in your practice and in your sort of uh, pursuit of academic interests to understand you know what is positive what needs work on and how do we go about achieving those ends so i understand that a part of this course is also about those skills so do you use advocacy how do you use advocacy how do you go about uh, effectuating human rights um, in uh, you know in in the best way possible so uh, without any further introduction let us jump right in because our time is limited uh, what we will do today uh, is again this first part of the session we will try to understand uh, the overview of human rights mainly I would try to give you a background to human rights laws what are the sources of human rights laws how have these human right, rights laws evolved uh, so how do you understand the you know origin story of uh, these human rights laws and then we will go on to uh, look at specific thematic rights and an overview of the Indian laws that further these particular rights. And this is not exhaustively listed, but these are some of the topics that we will be touching on. In this first session alone, we'll definitely be touching on, you know, specific civil and political rights, uh, how it works with regard to policing, gender justice, child rights, sexual minorities, etc. And then we will, in the afternoon session, uh, move on to further themes uh, and again these are mostly themes that you would be encountering in the coming days where you will be talking to uh, more experienced specialists who have been practitioners and uh, defenders of this, these fields uh, but today let's sort of get an overall picture so uh, like I said our first agenda is to understand the background of various human rights uh, human rights and human rights laws. So, uh, as we try to understand uh, these human rights laws, let's first try and see what is the background, what is the source of these laws relating to human rights. Uh, and the main source, of course, is the Constitution of India. Uh, the constitution as you know is actually the fountainhead of all laws all laws derive their legality derive their existence or their existence to the constitution particularly laws relating to human rights and what's interesting about the constitution again this is something that a lot of you would know and understand if it is please consider this a bit of a refresher because like i said there are people from varying uh, backgrounds so uh, if we are to understand the constitution, uh, it is the source of our laws, uh, the parliament, the state legislatures, various local governments can make laws and the government can and different state agencies can enforce these laws thanks to the constitution which specifies uh, roles and responsibilities of, of all bodies. Uh, when it comes to human rights itself, constitution is an extremely important document because it puts forth certain principles that 
are inalienable pretty much so we have fundamental rights and i'm sure a lot of speakers before me have emphasized uh, these fundamental rights uh, that's part 3 of the constitution you also have a chapter on directive principles of state policy which is uh, a chapter of the constitution that speaks that's basically a goal setting exercise uh, where the constitution speaks of goals of uh, the state uh, and lists it so the strict distinction at least at the time of uh, making of the constitution was that fundamental rights are specific concrete rights that are vested either in individuals or in groups uh, these are enforceable rights in that they are positive concrete rights that the government is supposed the state is supposed to um, guarantee uh, and that there are directive principles of state policy which are sort of more ideal goals and that the government will try to achieve these goals but they were not conceived to be as strictly enforceable as fundamental rights so during the time of constitutional design 70 years ago uh the idea was that you have separate fundamental fundamental rights which are the a lot of the human rights that we uh think of and that there were directive principles of state policy which is a more goal based again you know where there is progressive realization of those rights you may not be able to achieve those rights or guarantee those rights straight away but that the government the state will try to in a progressive manner slowly achieve those goals uh so the source of a lot of our human rights laws are these fundamental rights and are these directive principles of state policy and a lot of this is going to overlap with your uh, traditional you know uh, with a lot of our uh, human rights uh, international covenants and documents that you uh, already heard of be it udhr be it iccpr be it icpcr etc so uh what are the fundamental rights these are articles 12 to 35 of the constitution and i've listed out some of the important fundamental rights uh, and and what they actually speak about uh, i'm sure most of us are familiar with article 14 right to equality that all of us are equal before the law and are entitled to the equal protection of the law we will keep exploring this idea of equality uh because that is i think one of the key aspects of human rights right where all of us want to be treated as equal despite our differences in backgrounds and to ensure that each person uh by virtue of their individuality their personality enjoy equality they are not discriminated against articles 15 and 16 actually follow up on this equality build up on this right to equality uh understanding that you can't just have one single phrase which says you know all of us are now equal and therefore ensure equality we know that if there is to be some kind of substantive real meaningful equality there may need to be special provisions uh that are made some kind of affirmative action that's required so article 15 and 16 speak about that that they it prohibits uh discrimination that's what article 15 says and article 16 speaks about providing equality of opportunity for people irrespective of people's background in terms of differences in sex race you know caste religion etc article 17 is deals with uh, the abolition ban of untouchability uh, article 19 is uh, a very crucial uh, provision it lists out several fundamental freedoms or liberties uh almost conceived as a negative sort of right meaning that the state will not interfere with your exercise of certain freedoms and these include the freedom of speech the freedom of assembly freedom of association freedom of trade freedom of movement uh etc akila yes i'm sorry to interrupt uh, uh the slides are not moving so it's stuck on the first slide uh okay okay can you now see yes it's perfect now thank you okay okay 
I'm sorry about that. Uh, so uh, the uh, like I was saying, Article 19 deals with liberties, freedoms, uh, which are quite important. And, and I think you have a couple of sessions on uh, free speech, assembly, association, etc. So I'm not going to take uh, any more time, but just understand that the origin of this again is the fundamental rights. Article 20 and Article 22 deal with criminal laws uh, and protection uh, in sort of criminal trials, uh, etc. So there's the protection against double jeopardy, which means you cannot be tried for the same offense more than once. Uh, there's the right against self-incrimination. There is uh, some amount of protection against uh, preventive detention and arrests, etc. So all of these are again a part of the constitution. Article 21, arguably one of the most important provisions, uh, speaks of the right to life and personal liberty. That uh, everybody has a right to life and personal liberty and that you cannot be deprived of this right without due process of the law. Uh, this again is going to come into the picture again and again. So I would like for you to mark this up. Article 21A is something we will be talking about a little bit later as well. The right to education, uh, which has been realized more recently uh, after the RTE Act, etc. Uh, articles 23 and 24 deal with uh, right against exploitation and uh, forced labor. Uh, so, you know, uh, bonded labor, etc., trafficking, etc., is uh, prohibited as uh, a fundamental right itself. Articles 25 to 30 deal with the right to freedom of religion, uh, cultural and educational rights of uh, minorities. Uh, which is that all of us have a right to freely practice any belief religion of our own, that the state cannot have an official state religion. There should be some amount of distancing uh, of you know, the state of the church as you may traditionally understand it. And also in terms of uh, rights of minorities to protect their language, their culture by you know, various uh, affirmative measures, including having your own uh, educational institutions, etc. Article 32, again, arguably one of the most important parts of the Constitution, is the right to constitutional remedies, which is what uh, sort of uh, differentiates fundamental rights from uh, the directive principles, like I said, in its original state, which is that uh, if there is a violation of fundamental rights, you can approach the courts for constitutional remedies. Uh, so the right to address your grievances, get certain constitutional remedies itself is a part of your fundamental rights. Um, the directive principles of state policy, like I said, are more sort of uh, our ideals, goals set, uh, set up, uh, set for itself uh, by the state. And these would, a lot of them would be welfare rights. Again, this is not an exhaustive list. Uh, I would urge all, all of you to quickly just glance through, uh, you know, the fundamental rights and directive principles of state policy to just understand, you know, where we come from. Uh, Article 38 speaks of social, economic, political justice and having this kind of welfareist social order. Article 39 speaks of right to livelihood. It speaks of equal pay for equal work. Uh, it speaks of protecting the health and safety of workers. It also speaks of how uh, there should not be concentration of wealth and means of production. So a lot of our competition anti-monopoly laws actually come from this provision. Article 39A speaks of equal justice and free legal aid. Article 40 deals with local governments. Uh, so the importance of that, as all of us would understand, is that there should be some amount of devolution of power, that there should be, uh, you know, empowering grassroots to make decisions. It can't be centralized. And that is a big concern that we are seeing right now. Yes, so uh, it would be important to bear that in mind. Article 47 speaks of... Uh, 
raising levels of nutrition and standard of, of living of uh, people. Article 48 speaks of protecting environment and forests and wildlife. Again, these are just a few of the uh, uh, rights enshrined in the directive principles that I've listed out, but these I would understand, I would think are fairly important. Now, uh, to again understand how these uh, human rights, these sources come together, how human rights laws are, uh, you know, inf come into being and, and uh, there is some kind of breathing of life into this. Uh, I originally told you that fundamental rights are meant to be enforceable rights. There is a right to go to a court and get uh, remedies if there is violation of fundamental rights. I also told you that the directive principles of state policy are some kind of goals which are meant to be realized progressively, slowly over time. Uh, and while that was the original uh, sort of constitutional design, we all should also understand that not just the constitution, but all laws are in a sense living documents. They will have to evolve by interpretations, by amendments, by whatever means. Their meanings will have to change depending on the context, depending on the needs. And that is the only way by which laws and the constitution can stay relevant, can stay, uh, you know, uh, important for our times. So when we understand the constitution as a living document, it's not enough for us to just rest at, okay, this is how the constitution was created in the 1950, right? Uh, the way in which it's been enforced and the way in which a lot of human rights uh, laws have been created and uh, implemented is also because of the courts. Uh, and there's been a lot of expansion of these rights by the court. What I earlier showed you was the bare bones text as the constitution makers had drafted it. But there's been a lot of breathing of life into these fundamental rights. Uh, so whereas we first saw, you know, Article 14 might have said, you know, you have uh, the right to equality. Article 21 says there is a right to life. The way in which we make these more, we make these stronger, we make these more relevant is by interpreting these itself. And uh, the Supreme Court in the 70s and the 80s particularly was quite an important source of these human rights laws as well. Because uh, in India, where we follow a common law system, as most of us would know, uh, case law also is a source of law. So judge-made law, where a court hears a case and it uh, arrives at a particular decision, that decision also has the value of law. So while looking at these fundamental rights, the courts actually expanded them by saying that, you know, if we want to have meaningful fundamental rights, then you need to read certain things into them. So for example, uh, and more recently, right to privacy was read as a part of right to life. Uh, this is the Putasami case. Uh, a lot of this again keeps coming back to us in the context of Aadhaar and, and other things. Uh, right to life uh, was interpreted to mean right to life with dignity and that there is a right to uh, livelihood. Uh, another important kind of innovation and expansion was that freedom of speech, which is Article 191A, was read to understand that it also includes right to information. So. A lot of this is where uh, the courts and the state are inspired by international uh, conventions, treaties, and, and movement of conventional international law. Uh, and it also happens where you read fundamental rights and directive principles of state policy together. So like I said, the original intention was that the hum fundamental rights are enforceable, directive principles of state policy are not directly enforceable. By reading them together, what we have are fundamental rights which are enforceable 
which are not strictly mentioned in the uh, you know human rights that are enforceable which you may not find directly in the fundamental rights chapter so right to food is a part of right to life right to sustainable development is a part of right to life and a lot of these rights we will be seeing in uh, forthcoming uh, sessions i'm sure so uh, when we think of uh, sources of human rights law not just the text of the constitution you also need to understand the movement of jurisprudence of how these uh, have been interpreted by courts to mean new rights because the understanding was that just having bare bones you know saying that you have a right to life means nothing if you don't understand that life is life with dignity right uh, or that you need some amount of welfareism uh, some amount of uh, you know social justice aspects of, of uh, uh, policy making in order to meaningfully guarantee any kind of basic fundamental rights now uh, why are fundamental rights the same as human rights uh, and this is because of uh, you would have heard yesterday that natural uh, sort of human rights are also understood in the context of natural rights that these are rights that are inalienable meaning that it attaches to each person as an individual uh, that they cannot be taken away by anybody by any state by any other group right uh, so the constitution as well uh, the way in which it's been interpreted is that fundamental rights are a part of the basic structure of the constitution meaning that this is a part of the constitution that cannot be removed that cannot be you know disfigured because it is a part of the basic structure even through constitutional amendment so no amount of brute majority in the parliament can bring about change uh, you can again change it in a positive direction right you can make fundamental rights more expansive uh, but it cannot be taken away uh, unless you are dismantling the entire constitution and trying to replace it with a different constitution which effectively means changing the legal system altogether so uh, these fundamental rights are crucial human rights because they cannot be taken away by law they cannot be taken away by any other uh, amendment any other further political action uh, and this also means that any law that is passed uh, can be uh, tested against the human against human rights against fundamental rights and if they violate the spirit or the letter of fundamental rights they will be struck down as unconstitutional uh, and uh, yeah so that is uh, how fundamental rights of the indian constitution sort of very directly correlate to human rights and as a source of human rights law another important source of human rights law in india is international law itself uh, you would have come across several important conventions treaties uh, so far and you know in coming sessions as well how does that inform human rights laws in india uh, india signs up to various international conventions uh, and after it signs up to those uh, you know to to bodies of international law it comes back to india and it will have to create legislate on those particular areas uh, and this is how a lot of uh, laws have been made so if you look at article 253 of the constitution it says that parliament can it's an enabling provision which says that the parliament can make laws to implement international obligations so whatever obligations india takes up in the international stage whether it be under the aegis of the united nations or any other uh, body parliament can make laws to implement these obligations uh, and the directive principles of state policy which i told you is our goals of of the uh, state says the state should endeavor to have respect to foster respect for international law and treaty obligations but another common theme that you will see i'm sure is that india 
uh, does take on a lot of, of uh, these commitments internationally, but does not necessarily follow them up with uh, legislation or other means of, uh, you know, implementing their obligations. Uh, and in that case, again, the courts have come about and uh, have expanded domestic law using these international law uh, conventions. Uh, the sort of preeminent example of this is Vishakha versus uh, State of Rajasthan, a judgment I'm sure most of us are familiar with. Uh, this was a landmark legislation in 1997, uh, which for the first time spoke of sexual harassment at the workplace. Uh, I, again, I would ask you to sort of, you know, go back and uh, perhaps look at the uh, context of this case. But I can only tell you that because it's, it's so important. This was a case where uh, uh, oh, a human rights uh, work, a grassroots uh, worker was uh, sexually abused, was raped. Uh, for carrying on her uh, duty. She was uh, trying to stop child marriages, etc. And uh, when this case came up and, and when these facts were brought up before uh, the Supreme Court, again, this is a, a very disturbing story, but a, a very important story for a lot of us to uh, understand and keep in mind where uh, ultimately her uh, assailants were acquitted for uh, different reasons, they belong to uh, powerful communities. Uh, and this is one that definitely sort of shocked the conscience of uh, the courts. And the courts took this opportunity to speak of sexual harassment at the workplace. And uh, we, will, we will see the, uh, what has happened to those guidelines as well a little bit later. But uh, this is one of the uh, first occasions where the court directly used international law and India's commitment that it had taken in the international stage to expand domestic law itself. Uh, in India, where we did not have any laws on sexual harassment in the workplace, what the Supreme Court did was looked at various international conventions, various declarations that India was a signatory to, and then it said, yes, these are what India's commitments are at the world stage. And this is the gap that we find in domestic law and said that we'll have to use uh, that international law, infuse that into our domestic law and we can create new law. So this is a very important source of human rights laws where India has undertaken commitments, but it has not followed it up in the domestic space then there is a gap in the law as the Supreme Court understood it. And uh, there could be lawmaking uh, and you import those principles uh, where there is no contrary uh, sort of domestic law itself. Uh, so this is uh, again, one of the most important sources of international law and something we've seen again uh, in, in subsequent cases as well. Uh, I think I'll take a break now and invite questions because we had uh, thought that we'll have 25 minutes of uh, my monologue followed with questions and then, you know, uh, proceed that way. Uh, yeah. Matthew? Thanks, Akila. Just two questions which, I, which are relevant to what you were uh, presenting. Mm -hmm. uh, and this is what participants have asked earlier also. Mm -hmm. uh, the difference between how to differentiate between fundamental rights and directive principles. Mm -hmm. There are many people who are having this certain, certain kind of difficulty in understanding the differentiation. Mm -hmm. And why are they called directive principles? Mm -hmm. The reason why they are called directive principles. Mm -hmm. And one participant uh, from Tamil Nadu asked, uh, you mentioned about the principle 47, article 47. Mm -hmm. And you said it's an ideal goal. Mm -hmm. Why then it is not a fundamental right in the times of this pandemic? With mm. the, and the 47, I believe, is with regard to health, etc. So is there any possibility, if you can share a bit more with regard to that? Sure. Topic? Just these two questions. Sure. Okay. Uh, so the difference between fundamental rights and directive principles, uh, we'll have to understand by just, you know, rewinding back to the past. 
uh, and understanding how India was in you know the late 1940s, just after independence. So uh, the way in which uh, fundamental rights and directive principles of state policy are differentiated, the reason why they are differentiated is for very practical reasons. The original understanding was that India is a state which definitely wants to uh, have these principles, have uh, it wants to go about in and, and sort of create a country, a nation, uh, which was democratic, which believed in individual and group rights. But there was this big apprehension about whether or not the government had resources to effectuate all rights. So uh, some of you may have uh, come across this classification, which is pretty, uh, you know, uh, which, which till date actually exists in, in human rights law in terms of different generations of human rights. That there are civil and political rights, which are first generation rights, that there are, you know, economic, uh, social, cultural rights that are second generation rights. And that, you know, newer rights in terms of right to environment, etc., or third generation rights, etc. So uh, originally, when we understood a lot of human rights, they were conceived as negative liberties, where rights are guaranteed when the state just need not do anything to it. So when you speak of liberties, right, like Article uh, 19 liberties, right to freedom of speech, what is the content of that uh, right? The one dominant idea, I'm not saying this is the only way, Right now, there's, there's a lot of, of change in how we've been uh, looking at this law. But the original way of understanding a lot of these liberties was that you guarantee rights of individuals where the state just does not interfere. So there is non-discrimination when the state does not actively discriminate. There is guarantee of freedom of speech where the state does not censor. Right. So these were a lot of them are understood as negative rights. Uh, where the rights are guaranteed by virtue of the state's non-interference in personal affairs. A uh, uh, lot of economic uh, rights, socio-cultural rights, needed to be realized the state took active action. And this may require states to also invest a lot of money and resources. And the fear around that time was that India had very limited resources and they were not sure about whether or not they would be able to immediately achieve these uh, goals. And therefore, the way it was cast was that individual, a lot of negative rights, a lot of these civil political rights were understood as fundamental rights uh, and welfare goals of right to nutrition, right to livelihood, all of these need significant infrastructure, it needs significant, significant investment of the state. They cast it as directive principles of state policy. And I think the next part of the question was, why is it called directive principle? Because these are principles that are supposed to direct state action. Okay, Meaning that you can't simply go to court uh, and say, you know what, Article 48 or Article you know, 47 of my right is violated. But the state still cannot do anything to jeopardize these goals. Okay? They could not act in a way that is contrary to these goals. But that there will be progressive realization. And this is the term that is uh, used uh, in um, constitutional jurisprudence generally. Uh, that there will be slow realization, you know, basically set yourself these benchmarks for the future and that slowly there will be realization of these rights. So it is, these are principles that direct state action. That's why they are called directive principles of state policy, though it's a bit of a, a tongue twister, I guess. Uh, so yeah, the next question about Article 47 in specific and why is this not a fundamental right? In today's world, it is arguably a fundamental right. Right to food is a fundamental right. Uh, like I told you, the original constitutional design was that fundamental rights and directive principles of state policy were extremely different, that directive principles of state policy are not enforceable rights. But like I said, over the past few decades, uh, 
we have moved to a different jurisprudence which reads fundamental rights and directive principles of state policy together this is something that i had alluded very briefly so i guess you know some of you may have missed it but say okay let's take the example of article 21 right article 21 says that there is right to life let me actually just read it for you everyone protection of life and personal liberty no person shall be deprived of his life or personal liberty except according to procedure established by law this is the specific framing of article 21 like i said it has a lot of negatives it says no person shall be deprived of his life or personal liberty almost conceived as a negative right that you have a right to life which only means that the state will not do anything to jeopardize this except with a procedure established by law now the way in which this has been read is that how can you say that you have a right to life uh, and what does right to life actually mean can right to life just be you know breathing life is not breathing life is not just existing right life as a human being means that all of us would possess certain attributes you would need certain necessities would have access to certain necessities would be treated in a particular way with dignity so article 21 is now read as there is a right to life with dignity for people right and what does this dignity mean we read in values from uh, directive principles of state policy we read in right to livelihood we read in right to housing we read in right to food right because the just your uh, formulation of you know what is, if we understand life to just mean life without uh, aspects that are required to live a meaningful uh, human life uh, again would be just a mirage so um, in this day and age in the time of pandemic is article 47 a fundamental right aspects of it are definitely part of fundamental rights so uh, which is why even now we see a lot of action happening in different high courts uh, whereby uh, you know there are public interest litigation there is a lot of representation made to state saying you know how do you ensure right to food how do you ensure right to medical care all of these are definitely part of the fundamental rights now after sort of judicial interpretation uh does that answer yes akila yeah uh should we is is there any other question or should we move on to the next part we we'll move on to the next i'll sum up the other questions and present you okay all right uh so uh let's move on to specific uh thematic rights uh and the first we've already started speaking about this but i thought we need to speak a little bit more about these issues uh are civil and political rights uh and like i said you know a, a lot of article 14 19 21 we've already sort of touched upon uh but uh so in terms of understanding themes like i said civil and political rights are understood as you know the first generation of human rights almost as negative uh freedoms and liberties where which specifies you know a zone of non interference from state action so uh these in the context of uh policing and criminal law and we we are going to specifically look at this because we also have another session uh later on uh is again you have the right to life you have uh different personal freedoms when it comes to policing uh there is uh a definite right against uh you know custodial uh, violence there can't be any wrongful arrest so these are the implications of the civil and political rights when it comes to policing and uh, another area which is extremely controversial uh, are extrajudicial executions uh why is it controversial in my reading it definitely shouldn't be uh but you know uh, there is a lot of of public pressure uh, there is a lot of public support 
for extrajudicial executions. There's a lot of state support for extrajudicial execution. So this is one in which a lot of us human rights defenders have been uh, working on and People's Watch in particular has been uh, dealing with these issues as well. Uh, so I'll just speak a little bit more about uh, policing and human rights and you know how this forms a part of uh, you know fundamental rights. Uh, so when it comes to uh, traditional conventional human rights, we understand these human rights in a vertical sense, right? Of what an individual can claim against the government. Uh, against the state and one part of the state one actor in the state apparatus that almost all persons encounter and dread are the police so um, in India this is a very important part of human rights jurisprudence uh, which deals with policing which deals with uh, ensuring accountability for police excesses uh, and you know state excesses so uh, a lot of the original human rights jurisprudence article 21 jurisprudence also evolved in this context of the state taking matters in its own hands and behaving in an excessive manner whether it be you know uh, you know, blinding sort of uh, prisoners in in uh, some cases, whether it be excessive handcuffing, etc. So, uh, what is very clear is that there is a right to life, which also means there can't be private violence. Uh, there can't be private violence unleashed unleashed by the state either. So, any kind of custodial violence custodial torture, custodial death, custodial rape, etc., unfortunately is extremely common. And these are very definitely violation of Article 21. So whether it is wrongful arrest, whether it is uh, custodial violence, etc., these are very definitely uh, violative of uh, Article 21. And uh, there are remedies that are uh, crafted as well of uh, you know seeking compensation uh, from the uh, state etc so uh, it does seem uh, self explanatory and it is it, it is uh, quite logical and simple but we need to understand these are you know extremely important and again as persons interested in human rights uh, you know, one of the major actors that you encounter again and again is the police. How do you ensure accountability? And I think it bears, uh, it's, you know, it's, it's okay for us to spend a couple of minutes thinking about this and understanding that these are important human rights. Uh, extrajudicial executions, and again, I wanted to uh, spend a minute uh, talking about this uh, because of our own experiences uh, in this particular area. Uh, Encounter killings is something that all of us uh, have heard of in the newspapers uh, and everything. And encounter is a very cleverly worded, you know, euphemism for extrajudicial execution. What these are, uh, are basically the police acting as vigilantes, uh, taking law into the, their own hands, acting as, you know, uh, judge, executioner and jury and uh, getting rid of persons who are undesirable uh, and claiming that these were uh, encounters uh, and that you know this was an action of private defense self-defense and that they were protecting themselves and uh, the courts have seen this time and again uh, as human rights uh, defenders we know that the state uses this as a strategy, as a technique, uh, quite regularly. Almost all state gov states do use this. Uh, and accountability for these issues is extremely difficult to uh, achieve. Uh, again, like I said, partly because, uh, you know, a lot of, of actors are convinced that they are right in doing this. And this 
is also a way in which you know the state the police tries to evade um, judicial process because in their minds uh, they have caught a criminal uh, again they call them criminals uh, even though you know it should be something that the courts decide uh, and because they are afraid that they cannot get a conviction or for various other reasons they indulge in extra judicial execution now what article 21 says is that you cannot be deprived of your right to life or personal liberty without process of the law right without procedure established by law and what the law says is that when a person is suspected to have engaged in criminal activity you conduct investigation you hold a trial and depending on the outcome of the trial this person would be either acquitted or convicted bypassing this process uh, when a person is killed quote and quote in encounter this is definitely murder right murder perpetrated by public officials and to call this murder to understand this as murder has been a huge sort of uphill battle for human rights activists because uh, who would investigate into uh, an alleged incident of murder the police right so we are asking the persons the perpetrators to hold themselves accountable and to initiate process that only they can and so we can understand the difficulties and just how uh, difficult it is to get accountability right so to consider this as murder itself uh, was you know the subject matter of a lot of of continued litigation continued advocacy and uh, of late yes what the law says is that where there are extrajudicial execution and again nobody is going to use these words these are words that you mostly find only in uh, international texts in india they are called encounter killings uh, the nhrc has been written the supreme court has spoken about this that there should be certain safeguards that there should be an fir register uh by a different police station that there should be some amount of inquiry that goes into it that people who uh that police officers who indulge in these encounter killings should not be given out of turn promotions or rewards uh so this again is one big uh sort of uh area of uh law which is not satisfactory uh which you know we need to be really vigilant about because it's very very difficult to get accountability in individual cases but this is an area that i wanted to flag because um, you know people's watch all of us have also worked on this uh, for a bit and i'm sure we can uh, you know i can answer more questions in the q and a if anybody has uh, any uh, in uh, continuing with this theme of policing and human rights uh, i would tell you that so article 21 uh, speaks of like it told you certain procedural uh, safeguards and these procedural safeguards with regard to policing are also found in the crpc so we need to read the code of criminal procedure which is one of our uh, general laws which specify how uh, criminal cases are handled from investigation onwards uh, until you know the trial process uh, so for example the crpc would speak about the rights of arrested person so what do you do when uh, uh, a person is arrested the person should be uh, the police officer who arrests the person should identify themselves uh, you know their person who is arrested their family should be informed of the arrest uh, and various other safeguards and all of these are human right these are actually human rights laws even though we sometimes just understand them as procedural you know mundane laws but what these do is that they safeguard uh fundamental rights uh even though they look like mundane legislations so um this is one again we are not going to have a lot of time to go into uh these in in uh, detail uh, but again you know if anybody is curious about them we can uh, talk about that in the uh, q and a part of this session 
uh, okay, let me quickly jump into the next theme of uh, gender justice, right? Women's rights as human rights. And the source of a lot of this is Article 14, which is the equality provision that all of us are equal before the law, that there cannot be any discrimination and that some amount of special provisions, special laws, affirmative action may be necessary to uh, ensure substantive equality. Um, also, Article 21, like we already have said, which is the right to life with dignity, especially considering women's vulnerability uh, in terms of how they are targeted, how uh, a lot of uh, sexual assault, a lot of sexual violence is systematically carried out against them. So this is the broad background in which we understand uh, gender justice and rights of women. Uh, I'll very quickly go through some of the um, criminal laws and civil laws that pertain to uh, women's rights. Uh, the general law, general criminal law in the country is the Indian Penal Code, as a, a lot of you would know. And this is a somewhat comprehensive criminal code uh, that has hundreds and hundreds of provisions, uh, which lists out, uh, you know, uh, offenses and punishment. And it also has several provisions relating to uh, you know, offenses against uh, women, or offenses against the body, etc. We'll come to that in just a little bit. Uh, I just wanted to list out some of the other uh, criminal laws that exist as well. Uh, the Dowry Prohibition Act, uh, which makes giving and receiving of a dowry uh, a punishable offense. Uh, and again, this act would specify certain procedural uh, aspects as well, appointment of uh, key personnel like the prohibition officers, et cetera, at the district level to ensure implementation. We have the Immoral Traffic uh, Prevention Act uh, of 1956. There are also several provisions uh, regarding trafficking in the IPC itself, which now after amendment is even uh, stricter. Uh, we also have the PNDT, uh, PCPNDT Act, uh, which uh, is the Preconception and Prenatal Diagnostic Techniques Act of 1994, uh, which punishes sex selective practices using uh, medical diagnostic techniques. So this directly links to preventing female feticide. Uh, you also have laws at the state level. So uh, when it comes to uh, criminal laws, uh, both the center and state can legislate on this issue. There's something that we call concurrent jurisdiction. Uh, so at the state level as well, there are several enactments, there are several legislations uh, in order to uh, protect the rights of women. Uh, I'll quickly go through some of the uh, IPC offenses uh, relating to women. I'm not going to read this. I want to give you a broad overview of where we are right now. So uh, when it comes to uh, women's rights and uh, the criminal law, uh, India has made a lot of advancements in the past, say, eight to 10 years, uh, especially after uh, the Nirbhaya case a lot of changes have been made to the IPC uh, to include uh, several other kinds of offenses which were earlier not uh, specific crimes like voyeurism, like stalking, uh, et cetera. So what you have in front of you is a, a tabular column. Uh, there's only part of it that is uh, listed here, but you would have a, a copy of the PPD and you will see that the, the table is actually a little bit longer, but it's not uh, visible on the screen. Uh, but again, what I wanted to tell you is that uh, after 2012, uh, there, is, uh, there have been a lot of changes to the law. Uh, so when we try and when we try to look at the progress of uh, laws when it comes to, uh, especially to, to sexual offenses in India, uh, the history I'm sure a lot of us are, are aware of, uh, after the Nirbhaya uh, incident, uh, 
because of of um, for actually a lot of populist reasons, the law uh, was law reform came into question. Uh, J S Varma committee was uh, formed, and they came about with a set of, uh, in my opinion, wonderful uh, recommendations, which looked at uh, you know sexual offences in its entirety. Uh, and not just you know uh, understanding uh, crime and punishment in a simple manner as you know the the text of the law being sufficient to deter all uh, uh, all violations uh, but what we later ended up with is a different version of the law uh, the criminal law amendment act uh, did not take into account a lot of uh, the uh, recommendations of uh, the Varma committee. Again, those of you who are interested in this area, I would ask you to please go and read about this. Uh, uh, so what we now have are enhanced uh, penalties uh, for uh, sexual offenses and other offenses uh, relating to uh, women. Again, this is something that we can talk about a little bit later if that interests you. Uh, also, I'll take a few minutes later on to sum up what my assessment of the law is. Uh, but for now, I just wanted to flag that. Um, next are uh, civil laws uh, to protect women and uh, a couple of laws that I want to again highlight and flag right here are the Domestic Violence Act, Protection of Women from Domestic Violence Act of 2005, and the Sexual Harassment at Workplace Act uh, of 2013. Uh, now, uh, let me start with uh, the Sexual Harassment Act because we've already spoken a little bit about it uh, in the previous session. Remember, we spoke about the Vishakha case uh, where I said international law was used to expand on you know, a gap in the law, which is that India did not have a law on sexual harassment at the workplace. So what happened in 1997 was that the Supreme Court formulated certain guidelines to deal with sexual harassment at the workplace. So this is definitely a part of labor laws. Uh, and what the Supreme Court there did was, uh, it said because, uh, and it specified something very interesting. It said there should be internal committee uh, at the organization level. So it's basically uh, to deal with complaints of sexual harassment, grievance redressal mechanism was actually an internal process that um, there should be an internal complaints committee that is formed at every uh, organization, organizations employing more than 10 people. So this is not, uh, this does not directly work for the informal sector or very, very small enterprises. Uh, but that this internal complaints committee will act as this grievance redressal body, which will receive complaints of sexual harassment, will conduct an inquiry, will basically look, you know, act as a fact finding body and uh, come up with uh, recommendations. And these are civil remedies, sort of disciplinary remedies uh, that are available to a person. Um, so this, these guidelines uh, were formulated by the Supreme Court in 1997. The idea was that the parliament will look at it and it was meant to be a stopgap guideline. The idea was that in a year or so, the parliament will look at it and form, formulate, legislate its own law. Uh, but again, we know uh, that priorities uh, of governments are not always to our liking and it took you know, more than a decade, nearly two decades uh, for this legislation to come about. And the Sexual Harassment at Workplace Act mostly uh, replicates what the Vishakha guidelines uh, said. And now this is a very important uh, legislation for us to remember because, uh, like I said, every organization which employs more than 10 people should have this grievance redress and mechanism. Uh, and those uh, organizations that uh, do not have this uh, internal uh, mechanism, uh, there will be uh, a body at the district level, uh, which can then look at you know, the informal sector. So the idea is that uh, there is some way to uh, redress 
uh, issues of sexual harassment at workplace. And this also emphasizes a lot on prevention and prohibition. So there are positive duties cast on employers to, um, to spread this message, uh, to have advocacy of uh, you know, sexual harassment uh, issues, so ha conduct workshops and trainings, etc. So that's the Sexual Harassment at Workplace uh, Act um, that is a little bit more recent. Um, and especially after Me Too movement, there's been a lot of media attention on this law as well. And a lot of organizations have actually, you know, activated these grievance redressal mechanisms only after uh, the Me Too movement only over the past couple of months, a couple of years, sorry. Uh, but this is an extremely important uh, law that can be used to our benefit. Uh, when it comes to the domestic front, one of the most important uh, laws to protect women from violence uh, is the Domestic Violence Act, the Protection of Women from Domestic Violence Act of 2005. Now, the, uh, this again was a law that was uh, legislated after sustained advocacy and sustained uh, sort of demands by women's rights groups. So uh, this is an achievement of the you know, human rights um, uh, fraternity to some extent. What the uh, Domestic Violence Act speaks of, and, and the need for the, this particular act was that um, we know that women face a lot of violence. Uh, there are international statistics which say that violence against women is, uh, uh, you know, globally uh, amounts to some kind of an ep of epidemic proportions. So. There are statistics which even say that more than 25% of all women have faced uh, violence, have faced sexual harassment and have faced sexual violence. And more than 30% of all women have faced uh, violence at the hands of their spouse or their partners. So uh, this is a very, very disturbing statistic globally. And... Uh, you know, even in India, the trend and statistics sort of bear out a similar pattern of how uh, women uh, do need uh, protection against domestic violence. And the remedy that was available in the law earlier was only a criminal remedy, meaning if you face any kind of assault, if you face any kind of abuse, then you can uh, proceed against that person by preferring a police complaint and getting them some kind of punishment. And we know that that will not work out well in the context of families where women will obviously not want to, uh, you know, subject their family members to any criminal action. And this would only mean that you are, uh, you know, rendering uh, women uh, without any kind of, of legal remedy whatsoever. So it was important for women to get civil protection, civil rights, right? So that they can leave uh, sites of abuse so that they can um, escape domestic violence. So the Domestic Violence Act was enacted uh, because these civil remedies were found essential because women could not escape domestic violence without leaving their matrimonial house or their general household. And how do they do that, uh, given that otherwise they may not have financial protection, etc. So the Domestic Violence Act provides for remedies such as residence orders. So you can get uh, an order from the court that will allow you to stay in your house to make sure that you're not evicted from the house or you could get alternate housing, you could get monetary orders, you could get injunction protection orders to ensure that uh, you know some kind of abuse does not continue uh, so the domestic violence act is a very important key legislation that was um, uh, formulated that was that came into effect in 2005 again i would repeat that this is not a criminal law that this is a civil law that provides for civil remedies uh, monetary remedies, injunction remedies, protection remedies, etc. Right? 
Uh, other laws that uh, protect the women include, uh, you know, several other labor legislation such as Maternity Benefits Act, Equal Remuneration Act, Factories Act, etc. Uh, some of you may have uh, seen from the news that the Maternity Benefits Act was uh, recently uh, amended uh, to mean that uh, women can get up to 26 weeks of uh, paid leave. But that again only applies to the formal sector when you work in the informal sector where a lot of labor laws are not applicable. This may not be applicable to you. So uh, a lot of labor laws, and we'll, we'll see this in the later session, are specific to the formal sector. Uh, it may not apply to uh, really small enterprises. Uh, so these are some of the laws to protect uh, women. Let me stop right here and uh, invite questions. Matthew, is that fine? Yeah, perfect. I, was, I just sent you a message for the same. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Uh, just three questions. Like yeah. there were many questions. I have summarized one and mm -hmm. then putting two across to you sure like some participants have expressed with regard to the conflict of rights mm -hmm. for example in the current atmosphere mm -hmm. like in the cases of murder and rape and many mm -hmm. people have uh, mentioned with regard to the hyderabad uh, encounter the rape and the encounter uh, mm -hmm. like how to address the right to life of the victim versus right to life of the accused Mm. And in my own reading, I, when I was reading, I found very interesting that many people have used people who were encountered as accused. So that might be a lead. Sorry, sorry I, I didn't catch that line. For the people who were encountered, mm -hmm. uh, they termed them, termed them as accused. Ha, ha, ha. That might be a good lead for you to, st uh, to start this. Yeah. And uh, some participants have also asked, is it with regard to the courts taking a lot of time to render justice? It's mm -hmm. just a comment. Uh, mm -hmm. what I mentioned. Mm -hmm. There were a couple of people who asked a basic difference between the civil and criminal law and remedy. Okay, yeah. Uh, the third is, and I don't know if, if you'll be taking it later, but you can answer later also if you're mm -hmm. talking about it. But uh, are there any laws providing protection against torture and encounter killing? And there was a similar question with regard to marital rape. Mm -hmm. That's all for now. Okay. Okay, let me start from the uh, most, I think, uh, general question and then we can move on to specifics. Uh, okay, what's the difference between civil and uh, criminal laws? Uh, they mainly have to do with the remedy. Right, uh, criminal laws are uh, laws that specify a particular kind of offense, particular wrongs. So, uh, where the mainly you have the IPC Indian Penal Code, and then you have a host of uh, specific uh, criminal laws as well, and we will see some of of them. But criminal laws are those laws which specify crimes, which are egregious, very. Uh, serious wrongs. If you commit them, uh, there would be a certain process followed by law and uh, the end of this process, the conclusion of the process is uh, punishment, which could mean imprisonment uh, or fine or, or sometimes both. So those are criminal laws. So uh, where you understand, uh, you know, things like rape, murder, stealing, theft, right? Acid attack or, or anything or any other uh, kidnapping, etc. So these are wrongs which are considered wrongs against society. And uh, by violating this, by committing this crime, you are being subjected to a particular criminal process. This is usually investigated by the police. This is tried by the prosecution, which is the state. And the end result is an acquittal or a conviction. When we speak of civil laws, uh, these are basically laws that give you different remedies to compensate or to redress certain difficulties. So where I have, uh, say, a property dispute with my neighbor, 
right? Uh, in terms of where should my compound wall uh, stand? Uh, that is usually a civil uh, dispute. This is a general dispute between uh, two persons, say about property, about any other kind of entitlement. And uh, I can go to uh, a civil court and ask for certain remedies, which could be, you know, like knock off that compound wall or make sure that this property is mine or ask for certain compensation, etc. So the main difference between civil and criminal laws are the kind of remedies that you can get. Remedies in civil law include, like I said, compensation, injunction, which is some kind of a restraining order, specific performance, asking someone to do something. So where you may have, a, say, a, dis a contractual dispute, uh, uh, any kind of, of breach of contract, all of those are examples. Property disputes, you know, family, a lot of family disputes of, of uh, divorce, of adoption, any of those are civil laws. Uh, criminal laws are dealing with serious wrongs which are specified in the law as crimes and uh, a certain process follows leads up to uh, punishment. I hope that clarifies that's the main difference between civil and criminal law. And the one thing that's important to note is that a particular incident may give rise to civil and criminal remedies at the same time. So uh, the Sexual Harassment Act uh, that I spoke of Say I am an employee of an organization and I face very serious sexual harassment at the workplace. I can go to the police, uh, give a complaint and ask for a uh, criminal action because it also is a criminal offense. I can also go to, uh, you know, the internal grievance uh, redressal mechanism of a particular workplace and ask for remedies under the Sexual Harassment at Workplace Act. So one particular incident can give rise to uh, a civil remedy as well as a criminal remedy. A civil remedy is where a person gets some kind of, of a personal um, uh, redressal, be it monetary or otherwise. Criminal is where they are punished by the state, by the government, right? Uh, that's the main difference. Uh, there was an, so the, another question was on marital rape. Great question. Uh, marital rape is not considered uh, rape in India to this day because uh, the IPC says so. There's a specific marital rape, ex rape exception, which says that, you know, uh, of course, any unconsensual uh, sort of non consensual forced sex is rape, but where this is uh, perpetrated by a husband, uh, where the persons are not judicially separated, where they are still living in matrimony, it is not considered rape. This is the subject matter of a lot of uh, controversy. This is also sub judice right now. Uh, I know that the Delhi High Court is uh, also, uh, among others, I think the Supreme Court also is, is looking in, into this issue. Uh, they had even asked for a response from the government and the government had said that, you know, India is not in a, a state to... Uh, criminalize marital rape, uh, but a lot of, of international conventions uh, do speak of uh, rape being, uh, you know, of marital rape also being rape, but you have many countries as well that have reserved and, and uh, not accepted this. So this is a place where there is some amount of dynamism in the law. Uh, and hopefully the courts will strike it down as unconstitutional that uh, marital rape is rape. But right now, as the law stands, uh, marital rape is not considered an offense. Um, the Okay, so two questions uh, concerned the same kind of, uh, I, th I think, issues on uh, how do we understand encounters? Is there a conflict of rights? when it comes to uh, murder and encounter, etc. So what are the laws against uh, torture and what are the laws uh, prohibiting encounter killing? Uh, now we, uh, like I said, Article 21 is the most important protection, uh, which bans custodial torture, which bans encounter killing. Uh, there are also several human rights instruments. Uh, there are also, uh, uh, 
a lot of human rights bodies uh, monitor and look into this. Uh, so you cannot have, see, law against torture pretty much stems from the IPC where there can be no private assault of a person. Uh, and it is protected by Article 21, which says that you cannot deprive a person of their life or personal liberty, uh, except accord in accordance with due process of law. There is no law which authorizes uh, police or other personnel to uh, inflict violence. So it definitely is uh, a legal violation. Uh, is there a conflict of rights when it comes to uh, say, a murder case and where the accused is killed in an encounter. Um, now, I don't understand that there are conflict of rights. I would say that one particular rights violation is then, you know, compounded by an additional rights violation in such a case, right? What do I mean by that? Uh, where a person is subject to sexual violence, where a person is subject to uh, a heinous crime such as rape or murder, there is a definitive rights violation, right? Uh, their Article 21 rights are violated, their bodily autonomy is violated. Uh, how do you redress this rights violation? This has to be redressed by ensuring certain preventive uh, mechanisms by trying to find out what are the reasons that this was allowed to happen at the societal level or at the institutional legal level. Also, how do you have accountability and how do you make sure that the persons responsible for this are punished, which means putting uh, into action the criminal justice system, identifying the perpetrators, uh, filing suitable FAR against them, uh, investigating the case properly, maintaining, uh, you, you know, having a fair impartial uh, investigation, going to trial, and ultimately uh, ensuring that there is punishment that happens. Where you bypass this entire process and say that because there has been one egregious violation, and it's a, a very bad one, it's a very serious violation, can you make this okay by committing another rights violation? Uh, see, there are different, we don't have, uh, I think, enough time to, to uh, list out all the reasons why this is wrong. But we need to understand that the criminal justice system exists for a reason. And the criminal justice system uh, being designed the way it is, is actually an embodiment of a lot of human rights principles. That uh, a person is considered to be innocent before they are uh, found to be guilty by a competent court of the law. Uh, until then, how can you call somebody an accused, right? Uh, how can you call somebody as a criminal if they are not so found by a particular uh, process? Uh, it is very easy for, and again, because of a lot of trial by media as well, uh, it is easy to think that we know all the answers, that fact finding uh, happens by media uh, and that uh, you know punishment should be instant. But the rule of law requires that each person uh, should be, uh, is entitled to a right to free and fair trial, that they have an opportunity to defend themselves, uh, an opportunity to put forward their case, and the prosecution should prove uh, that they had committed certain offenses. Uh, for a variety of reasons, including to cover up shoddy investigation, encounter killings, which are murder, is often deployed and is, I think, uh, packaged and delivered to us as a solution, as instant justice. And I think we need to resist uh, understanding this as instant justice because justice should also be, you know, something that you arrive at through an impartial process. Uh, to me, it's really interesting that we as people are generally extremely suspicious of the police for good reason. But when it comes to this uh, issue, we immediately blindly want to believe what the police says and believe that a person that they have already identified and sometimes killed is the perpetrator. 
and uh, believe that justice is uh, is is delivered uh, by this violation so in my mind two wrongs do not make a right uh, and i would uh, mr henry is here he would he can answer this much better than me uh, but yeah i would also say that well is one of the reasons why uh, people support this uh, support encounter killings court delays perhaps uh, so but what we need to do is strengthen the system and not weaken it further uh, we need to make sure that each case is uh, handled in a, in a fair impartial manner and that there are no endemic court delays which is uh, which is true uh, but i think two wrongs will not make a right akila yeah shall we wind up for this morning here at this sure. sure sure right, so that uh, you can start fresh again in the afternoon okay thank you akila i just want to um, to uh, say a few things before uh, so that we keep to time uh, we have 5 minutes participants you would have seen that there was a lot of revision today and i'm so thankful to akila for the revision you had a revision of what human rights are of what right to life is equality is liberty is and dignity is akila's session served as a good revision for those of you who found yesterday afternoon session a little uh, difficult to follow you are now able to understand what are civil and political rights and this afternoon she will also move, move into what are socio economic cultural rights so today you come into revision also please follow the revision is planned because law is difficult i can i can i i have i've got feedback so terminologies are difficult technical terms are difficult ask them to to repeat the technical terms twice we can't do that but i'll tell you the remedy you saw the classification therefore and this is served as an overview this is served as an overview now don't worry about encounters we will come back to encounters don't worry about women laws we will come back to women laws there is going to be one specialist who is going to do all this again but what you will see is that many things that that happened today that were presented today very effectively by akila are also changes in laws relating to women which took place after the nirbhaya case but by just saying that it took place after the nirbhaya case you will forget you will forget what maya said you will forget what ravi said engage there was an engagement of people young people women men across the streets after the nirbhaya case and it is that engagement you call it protest you call it whatever you want i call it an engagement that passionate engagement of young people to protect the life of women was what brought all these changes in the laws relating to women the, the sections that were indicated by akila very effectively friends um the video link has been shared with you the video link of day 1 2 and 3 are already available with you so for those of you who in your in your feedback session said we want the video link you ask and it is given it needed a little more time now our our people are able to to spend a little more time on that we have the video link on youtube please listen to it again and again and and again and it will be definitely useful to all of you i now see that there is a request for challenging activities i like to know what challenging activities are comparing the udhr with the constitution of india is extremely challenging because that is where you learn that is where i learned i learned that every article in the udhr has been reflected in my constitution and then i was able to take it in that is the challenge but if you don't do it it is not challenging so do it we will definitely grow from small to higher levels but i am happy that you are asking for challenging activities um yes i think i have i have i have said everything we had we had 181 participants when akila started and immediately thereafter it rose to 197 akila dr vasanthi devi is also here passionately listening to you yes she is also here i need to tell 
tell the participants that they should be inspired by Dr. Vasanthi Devi, who sits quietly in this audience, wanting to learn at the age of 84, while she is working on issues of right to education in schools. Let us be inspired by, by very senior people like her, who have the spirit of engagement in them. This is what we need to continuously um, learn from such people. There she is on the screen. There she is on the screen. Dr. Vasanthi Devi, you want to say a word? You will be, you will be unmuted. Unmute Vasanthi Devi, madam, please. Okay. Yes, ma'am. Well, as you say, we belong to the older generation that's still active. And we are, I'm so happy to see Akila, the next generation or the generation even after that, so passionately presenting all these issues with tremendous clarity. And we want young people like Akila to come out and, and engage much more with the people who need to be um, need to be trained in what law is. And also, as you said, take, taking law not into their hands, but taking it up on the streets, as you said, engaging it. Uh, hopefully in the afternoon session, uh, the burning issue of today, the migrants, is there anything in our law through which we can challenge this, this historic tragedy, this historic wrong that is being done to a huge section of the people of India. So sure. is there anything in the law to sure. which this can be challenged? I know that this can be challenged only, only by a movement on the streets, but is there anything else? The sure. Right to dignity, right to life, right to basic uh, food and nutrition, the basic obligations of the state to its citizens. So I would be very happy if Akila can engage with this, the social economic rights in the afternoon. Thank well, you. Well, well. All the best, Akila. It was Thank great. You. It was absolutely great. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you ma'am. And uh, all the academicians on the screen, this should be your inspiration. You have to be passionate like this, otherwise young people will laugh at you. Because young people need inspiration from each one of you. And therefore, you are, those who are here for value education, human rights education, become passionate. Take the knowledge inside, but become passionate. But you become passionate when you engage with people. I saw a lot of questions on reservation. A lot of lecturers asking questions on reservation. Don't worry, we will have a special lecture on reservation. But one question I will leave with you. Many of you would not have been in college. Many of you would not be professors. Many of you would not be professors. Many of you would not be teaching in schools and colleges if reservation was not there. Ponder over this question. You don't need to agree with me. Never agree with me. Anything I say, just ponder over it. We will also have a special lecture on the Citizenship Amendment Act because there were a lot of questions. We will not leave you, not leave those questions. All the questions you ask on chat are being, are being taken in by us. I assure you of that. The morning session is over. It is already three minutes excess. I will be cursed by you all for that. Thank you very much for your patience. See you once again at 3.45 for a very, very interesting session that will start at 4 o'clock. Thank, Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Akila. Thank you very much, Akila. Thank you, Akila. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you for the opportunity. Thank you for listening. Good session.